what I'm going to talk about is optimization of line clearance process or processes as we'll come to see. That one of the things that is already becoming evident to me even from what we've seen so far is that solving this problem of turning that big pyramid into the smallest, thinnest possible pyramid that we can get um, is not going to be achieved <coughs> by any one thing alone. It's going to be achieved by a combination of things. And I thought that was a particularly useful slide, Andy, that sort of about third from the end, just listing the things that you can do as retrofits now on machines just to improve your chances of minimising the risk of errors. And I'll talk a little bit more about that from a different perspective as we move on. So I'm going to talk about optimising the line clearance processes and what I'm going to be saying here is lots and lots of little things all done well will really help to reduce that pyramid that Liz showed you. Uh, and some of the things I'm going to talk about is looking at a bit about line definition and layout. Kevin did allude to that as well in some of those um, uh, deficiencies, critical and major deficiencies on inspections. Defining and managing the line clearance process. A little bit about equipment modifications, although I'm not as well qualified as Andy or Paul to advise you on that. Something I do know a bit about, and Liz knows quite a lot about, and something we've studied a lot is, is the people element of this. Look at training. Kevin did make an allusion again to, you've got to get that training right. And I thought it was a fantastic moment. He said, you know, writing down on your deviation report that you retrained an operator who's already probably 10 times been retrained in that same procedure, you know, doesn't fill the inspectors with a lot of confidence. So we'll have a look at that. Let's talk a little bit about hotspots, because they're, they're a particular favour of mine, are hotspots. Um, and and a, dangerous, uh, a dangerous area, unless you know what you're doing with hotspots. A tiny bit about documentation. And then this. I'm going to finish off with this, because this is annoying me more than anything else in this, this whole area, as we look around the industry. First thing that needs doing um, and by the way, all of this, virtually all of this uh, the presentation has been compiled from audits that Liz and I have done in packaging areas. Right? There's nothing here that we haven't seen in one or many, many in different uh, packaging operations. The first thing is making sure that you know what's online and what's offline. You can go in and you can ask operators is that online or is it offline? Well, it's, uh, there's a line on the floor and you've got a big cupboard which is full of machine parts or tools or something uh, and it's half on and it's half off and that could apply to all sorts of things. So making sure that you know what's online and offline is critical to getting this thing right. Partitions between lines plus floor markings at line ends are the very, very minimum required. And I'm going to put this up today and say that I think the minimum for that nowadays is two metres. One and a half metres was common some years ago, but what you find with one and a half metre partitions is that people leave things on the top of them. I have actually done that myself inadvertently because you get absent-minded and you forget about things. And I can see Terry smiling because he is remembering some incidents that took place in the old days at Glaxo, where that did happen as well, where people you know, left things inadvertently on the top of partitions, and guess what? They fall over onto the other side. The norm now is really a separate room. Any, any new packaging op operation we go into, it's a separate room completely for each packaging line. And I applaud that. I think that's the way to go, totally enclosing the whole thing. But even if you've got separate rooms, the important thing is that you do actually manage effective segregation, particularly with respect to staging areas and corridors. There's no point in having a self-contained room with the equipment in it if you leave the doors open and you've got pallets and stuff stored in the corridor that overspills into the area, and you see it. So you need uh, to, to get that segregation sorted out. Now, what I always advise companies, and I would advise you all now, is to start off 
Whatever you've got, whatever your packaging operation is, whether it's very old or whether it's the very latest thing with the four walls and the equipment machinery in there, is start off with a concept of, I will only have my four walls, even if two of those walls are just lines on the floor at the end of the line. Start off with those, put the line equipment in and say, right, anything else has got to fight to get on. Anything else has got to be justified if it's going to be brought onto line. And that should apply to the smallest thing, whether it's a desk, whether it's a tool chest, engineering, paraphernalia, whatever. Right? A case has to be made for its existence online. Now, I found that's a very good discipline and a very good practical tool to use. Anything that is not outside the boundaries is considered online. So if you do justify that you are going to leave a tool chest on the line, then that has to be as much part of the line clearance as the line equipment or anything else in that line area. And that does tend to, again, force you to move as much as possible offline. Now, operators have got a rotten job to do here. You know, we've got great sympathy for operators in this whole line clearance operation because they do get blamed. They really, really do get blamed, and often the fault is not theirs. And they need to know what they're expected to clear, and that means they need to know what's online and what is offline. You can't clean where there's clutter. Um, we tend to have a pretty cluttery house where I live. My wife is a, is a sort of a free spirit when it comes to these things. I can see Sue and Claire and Liz smiling at that. They think that I'm equally to blame, but I'm actually a perfectionist, but I'm just surrounded by all this clutter because of wife and kids. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. But you can't clean where, the, where there's clutter. It's impossible to do so. Um, it's, it's a psychological barrier, it's a practical barrier, it's a time barrier. You will not clean where you've got to lift things up and move them around about the place. So getting the minimum on there is absolutely imperative. Status signs and labels. When line clearance is going on, nobody other than those engaged in that activity should have the ability to get onto the line. I think uh, Kevin mentioned earlier on, you know, seeing people walk freely from line to line, it is not on. It is not acceptable. Because when you do that line clearance operation, you know, let's show that slide of the declining um, concentration. I'm going to show it again a little bit later on this afternoon. But when that's actually happening, you need to make sure that people are totally or as free as possible from any distractions that are around them. You wouldn't believe how many times we go into packaging operations, and I mean, I don't even know how they get away with it from a health and safety perspective, but you can hardly see you know, what's going on because it's not well lit, or there are tubes like this in the ceiling and half of them have gone out and nobody's bothered to, to replace them. So making sure that the whole thing is well illuminated is, is a key part of the premises qualification. Right. I'm going to labour this point because I think it's important. I was very pleased to see that uh, it seems to be coming policy at the Irish Medicines Board as well because Kevin again alluded to separate clearance and checking processes. I'm going to use different terminology, but I do mean the same thing. There are two distinct phases involved in line clearance. The first of those is removal of materials from the line and cleaning the line as appropriate, you know? That's what I'm going to call the cleaning phase. Now you could argue, I think Kevin referred to the, the, the calling that the clearing phase. I like to think of line clearance as two processes. But the first of those is cleaning, getting all the stuff off the line, doing what you can to get it the way you want it. When that has finished, there is a, another process that starts, which is a checking process checking that the line is clear of any potential rogue items. In most companies that I go to, the cleaning and the checking are merged to a greater or a lesser extent. Usually this is betrayed by the fact that the line clearance documentation consists of um, parts of the line are listed, and then there's a column to the right for the signatures, 
usually with no instructions at all on how to actually clean those particular bits. And then the second column to the right of that column, so there are two columns down to the right of this list, uh, is a checking column, uh, which again has no instructions for checking. And to me, that indicates merging of those two processes. It is absolutely essential to separate the cleaning from the checking. You know, I'm usually, uh, as Liz will tell you, somebody who enjoys a good debate or a good technical debate, and we often have many of them in hotels or on planes about the best way of tackling issues. I'm not prepared to debate this one. It is an absolute essential to me. You've got to separate those two processes because they are different processes. You cannot clean and check at the same time. Typically, cleaning may involve the use of vacuum cleaners or high-pressure air jets or whatever. You can easily move unseen items along the line when you are doing that. So an area that you've just cleaned and apparently, inverted commas, checked, right, can then become contaminated again simply by the cleaning method that you're using. So do please buy into that, separate your cleaning from your checking. And we've put together this diagram just to try and illustrate that. The whole of line clearance is that, I've called it that. It consists of a cleaning phase or a checking phase. All right, if you want to call it something else, I'm not too bothered, although I think it would be nice if we could actually um, agree on a common terminology uh, throughout the industry. Checking also needs to be an independent process. Um, and so I would always want to see, um, for any individual item of equipment, uh, the signatures of different persons for the cleaning and for the checking. What I'm trying to say is that if you're talking about a cartner and somebody has cleaned the cartner to the best of their ability, then I would want to see that the checking had been carried out by somebody else. Not necessarily a supervisor, not necessarily somebody from QA, preferably by somebody who is knowledgeable about the line, and I'll say that, well, it's essential that it's somebody knowledgeable about the line, and we'll say a little bit more about that later. So, um, if the same operators are involved in bro both processes, a concept known as zonal line clearance with swap over is a useful approach. You know, whereby one cleans here, one cleans there, and then you swap and one checks and that way around. It helps keep the concentration up uh, and it helps establish responsibility with one person. And it breaks the line up into manageable chunks as well. I think that's a useful way of doing things. But the important thing is that the check should be done by somebody who knows the line. Now, what Kevin was saying he wants QA to, to sign off, or one of the concepts that, that, that they're looking at is getting QA to sign, yeah, okay, everything shows me that the line has been properly cleaned and checked and therefore that it's, it's ready to run again. But he wasn't saying that a QA person should do the check. Because QA people don't know the lines. You know, this stuff needs to be done by people who work on the lines, who know the lines, who've got the knowledge and experience necessary to do this very difficult and complex task. It's a critical process and it's got to be done properly, it's got to be done consistently and it's got to be done effectively and it's got to be done those three things every single time it's done. You can't have a bad day. So we've got to minimise risk by minimising the chances of operators having a bad day. Well, equipment modifications can help. Um, I'm not going to go into this in any detail because Andy has, uh, has, has covered it and I know Paul is going to be covering it from a different perspective as well. So for new packaging equipment, obviously the way forward is you design to facilitate line clearance. And I thought that was fantastic to see what was coming in the future. One thing that did strike me, I don't know whether it struck you, was that although obviously millions of man-hours have gone into highly complex thought processes to try and produce this optimization of line design, the solutions that they've come up with have been fantastically simple. They all look simple. You know, the, these the trolleys coming up and just taking the whole thing off. What a fantastic aid to line clearance that's going to be. Uh, and one of the things I've learned in my lifetime 
His quality comes from simplicity. It never, ever comes from complexity. So um, I'm looking forward to seeing this new generation of uh, packaging machines. But, and with all due respect, Andy, a lot of it is a lot different from what I see as we go around the industry at the moment. Existing line equipment, well, transparent guards, internal lighting, use of torches if you're going to do the line checking, the key surfaces, the painting of them in particular, colour codes, I've seen that in a couple of places now, I think it's a great idea. Um, but the thing I would like to stress to you is, well, two things, it should be a process of continuous improvement. And the other thing is, you can start at any time, yeah? You can start at any time, but you must be thinking about all the time, getting rid of those traps that Andy talked about, you know, just, it's amazing how many times tablets get stuck in things like cables, because there's three or four cables running together, and nobody's thought to sort of block them off and put them into a conduit so that they can't form a rogue trap. So it's a matter of always looking to modify the lines to make sure that you get them optimally running from, from that perspective. I've seen a company in Ireland um, who have done a fantastic amount in terms of all of these things, all of these things here, um, and the, the, the lines just look fantastic. They're totally perspex. These are quite, well, I wouldn't say very old, but they're not, they're not the latest of, of machines, uh, and they've just done a tremendous amount of work. I have to say, I think it was in response to a visitation from the IMB. <laughs>